Hi, good morning. Welcome to church this morning. I trust you've come ready to sing and worship the Lord in song and to hear what he has to lay on our hearts today. Let's stand together. Turn in our hymn books to page 537. We'll sing, Ye Must Be Born Again. <laughs> Oh 
once again. We're glad that you have joined with us this morning. We get to hear from our missionary Keith Stensis, serving the Lord in Uganda, one of our two missionaries serving the Lord in Uganda. And he writes to us, These last two months have truly been a testimony to God's grace and his working in the hearts and lives of so many people. I continue to be amazed at the amazing grace of God. 1,000 Bibles. Recently, the King James Bible celebrated its 412th anniversary since publication and is still the best-selling book of all times and remains the most printed work in the English language. One of the greatest privileges that I have is the propagation of the Bible in the English language. With English being one of the official languages of Uganda, we have the opportunity to give out hundreds of Bibles. Pastor Jeff Lines, a Bible Baptist church in Shreveport, Louisiana, recently raised the money to purchase 1,000 Bibles. What a blessing to make these available to our people. In addition to this, my colleague and fellow missionary, Brother Thomas Irvin, is working with several of our Ugandan men to get the Word of God translated into the Lugada language. It is a monumental task that needs your prayers. But what a blessing already to see the word of God that has been completed in the Lugaga, I mispronounced that second time, language. One graduation. What a joy it was to see our youngest son, Skyler, graduate from high school this year. We are very proud of his accomplishments and are excited about his potential to serve the Lord. He will remain with us here in Uganda for about a year, taking online college courses, and then we'll tra transfer to Capital City Baptist College when we return for our furlough in 2024. I am so blessed to have a wife that loves homeschooling her children, five down and one to go. Pray for Skyler as he makes his transition in his life. And this is amazing. 32 baptisms. While in Calero last month for teaching in the Bambasa Baptist Bible Training Center, we had the opportunity to baptize 32 new converts from two of the churches that we work with. We pack them tightly into our two vehicles to travel to the shores of Lake Cuyoga for baptism. Praise the Lord for the evangelistic efforts of these churches. Continue to pray for the Calero Ministries. We also had the opportunity of spending a week with Pastor Mark and a team from his home church area of Grace Baptist Church in Raleigh, Illinois. It has been a blessing to combine our efforts with his, uh, with his in helping train these men to become pastors. A second, church roofing. In our last prayer letter, we told you about roofing the church building in Buzaragalo. This past month, through the generous giving of Newberry Baptist Church in Winter Haven, Florida, we were able to roof another church building, the Kizanga Independent Baptist Church. Up to this point, the church has been meeting in a mud structure with a tin roof that was on the verge of collapse. How exciting it was to see them meeting in their new building for the first time after the roof was put on. The place was packed on its very first service. Continue to pray for both churches as they seek to raise the funds for doors and windows. One potential well. One of the problems that we continue to face in a Claro training ministry is the need for water. The town water is only on for about one hour a day. It's not enough to supply the washing, bathing, and cooking for over the, for the 70 people in training. We added tanks for water harvest, but during the dry season, even the tanks run out. Pastor Jeff Lines mentioned above is currently raising the funds for drilling a well. Not only will the, this help with our everyday needs, but it will also help able to construct a baptistry so that we can continue to baptize there at the church instead of traveling to the lake. Please pray for this need and that it will be met. The only obstacle in our way now is permission letter from the Ministry of Water and Environment in order to drill the well. Please pray for the letter of approval. And one special request. Please continue to keep in prayer our reapplication for permanent residency. It has been applied for and reapplied for several times. We are hoping that this last piece of paperwork being required will complete the immigration requirements. This approval will give us 10 more years of residency here, enabling us to continue to work here and do what God has called us to do. So the highlights of this letter were 1,000 Bibles, one graduation, 32 baptized, one well, and one special request for the residency permit. May the Lord richly bless you as you continue in his work together. 
Keith Stences serving the Lord in Uganda. So a wonderful update from the Stences family serving the Lord in Uganda. We'll ask the ushers to come forward at this time. We will take up our morning offering. Allow the church family to give to the Lord's work here, to missions around the world, and to be a blessing to those in our community. Let's take a moment and pray. Our wonderful heart, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. Lord, this week has been filled with your grace, filled with your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your faithful, faithfulness to us. Lord, we thank you for the 32 converts that we can rejoice in this morning have taken the step of obedience and been baptized. Lord, we thank you for Keith Stensis and his family as they minister in so many ways in Uganda. Lord, it encourages our hearts to see their diligence for you. I pray that you'd richly bless them, strengthen them, and provide for them. For all of our missionary families as they serve you around the world, Lord, would today be a blessed day. Would the word of God go forth with much power. Lord, I pray that you bless our pastor as he brings forth the word. Pray that you give him the strength Open our hearts, Lord, and teach us, we pray. Revive our hearts as we need your filling, Lord. Bless this offering. Pray that it be used to please you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, uh, some of you are probably wondering what happened with our faith promise uh, missions commitment. We were asking the Lord all the month of April to uh, increase our global footprint. In other words, we want to have a greater impact on the world through our prayers, through our giving, and through our sending. And uh, our faith promise did increase. So we uh, are now committed to giving. And by the way, if you didn't get a chance to do that and you still want to participate, you'll find a card like this back on the back table. You can fill it out. If you need any help or have any questions, you can let me know. Just drop it in the offering plate or drop it by the office so that we can add it to the total. But the total right now, our promise for a, a per week is $2,740. That's an increase of $262 over our last promise. And that means that uh, we will be giving by God's grace through the exercise of faith $142,480 uh, through faith promise giving this year. That's an increase of $13,624 for the year. So praise the Lord. Thank you for taking that step of faith, for letting God lead you and guide you. And I hope that you will now be faithful in trusting the Lord. Remember what Brother uh, Marawali taught us. It is uh, God giving through you what he otherwise would not give to you, except that he knows that you will give it to world evangelization. And so let's trust the Lord. His supply is unlimited. One of the very first mission works that we took on for support uh, as a church family was um, the work of Faithway Baptist Col uh, College and Faithway Baptist Church. I have, I've had the joy of watching the college develop and grow and prosper through the years under successive pastors. 
and it's been my delight as well. One of the joys of staying put in one place for a long time is that you get to watch kids grow up and go out to serve the Lord and a new crop grow up, and it's been a real blessing, and I love these kids. I'm so glad they're here. They've just ended their year at Faithway Baptist College, and uh, we are the first trip out. So they are, they are coming to share with us a message and song, and, and of course our desire is that you will get a greater vision for uh, the college and the work of training servants for the master. That's always been the theme of the college. And uh, there are graduates of Faithway Baptist College serving the Lord around the world on the mission field and pulpits and in classrooms and all kinds of places. And if you are here and a student, especially in your high school years, you ought to prayerfully consider if God wouldn't have you go for at least one year to Bible college. And here's one right close to home. And uh, you, would you would love it. The, the, the church that it's connected with is a wonderful church, wonderful church family. So, Faithway, we're glad you're here. Come and minister to us in song, if you would, please. Ajax, Ontario. I will be a senior this year and will graduate with a Bachelor of Theology degree. Hello, my name is Marcus Seeley and I'm from St. John, New Brunswick. I'm a graduate with a Certificate of Biblical Studies. My name is Marco Cachola. I'm from Toronto, Ontario. I'm a graduate with a Bachelor of Religious Education degree. Hi, my name is Dean Sinico. I will be a senior this coming year and I'm graduating with a Bachelor of Theology degree. And I am Dale Sinico. I am a graduate with a Bachelor of Theology degree. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 25 says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. We'd like to encourage you today to consider the fact that our Bible stands the test of time. It comforts and encourages us. It shows us the only way of salvation and how to have a right relationship with God. Its truth cannot be refuted, and while some have tried, they cannot destroy it. I will plant my feet on its firm foundation, for the Bible stands. The Bible stands like a rock undaunted, mid the raging storms of time. Its pages burn with the truth eternal, and they glow with the light sublime. The Bible stands like a mountain towering far above the works of man. Its truth by none ever was refuted, and destroy it they never can. stands though the hills may tumble it'll firmly stand when the earth shall crumble i will plant my feet on its firm foundation for the bible stands the bible stands All its precepts I will obey. The Bible stands, every test we give it, for its author is divine. By grace alone I expect to live it, and to prove it and make it mine. The Bible stands, though stand when the earth shall crumble. I will plant my feet on its firm foundation for the Bible stands. Yes, the Bible
My name is Emma Wood. I am from Breslau, Ontario, and I'm studying for a Bachelor of Sacred Music degree. My name is Brienne Featherstone. I'm from Mount Bridges, Ontario, and I'm studying for my Bachelor of Religious Education. Romans 3, 23 and 24 say, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The definition of justified is declared or made righteous in the sight of God. As a Christian, God declares me righteous in his sight, not because of what I have done, but because of what he did for me on Calvary. At daybreak he entered the temple to teach. All of the crowd sat down at his feet. He spoke with such wisdom as they never heard. In amazement they listened as he taught the word. All of a sudden, in burst through the door, a woman was brought and stood near the Lord. The sins she'd committed were not like the rest. Caught in adultery, the penalty death. As they waited her sentence with stones in their hands, Jesus knelt down and wrote in the sand. He lifted his eyes and he spoke to each one. You without sin cast the first stone. In just a few moments, her accusers were gone. No one around her, she was standing alone. He forgave her the sin, and she went on her way. As she ran through the city, with joy she proclaimed, Justify had never sinned, Justify was always cleansed, Justify had never wandered so far from Just a few moments, my sin was too great. My accusers had gathered, oh, could this be the day? I cried out to Jesus, he came in my stead. He told my accusers, I paid all his debt. Just if I had never sinned, just if I was always cleansed, if I had never wandered so far from so home, Jesus took all my sin away. He gives new mercies every day. And now I'm living my life. Now I'm living my life. Just if I had never sinned. Just as 
was one, you made stars to shine, created the sun, I am amazed, in your mercy and grace, your wisdom and ways, every promise you make, a promise you keep, in your beauty I see your heart to redeem, I'm amazed at your greatness, I am amazed, I'm amazed at your greatness, oh God. I am amazed, you put all things in place as trials become a gift of God's grace. Almighty God, you know what is best, you cause us to trust, you give us your rest. I am amazed, I am amazed, how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Is that your greatness? Oh God, I am amazed. Romans 5 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. suffer such betrayal in anguish kneeling there why leave his mother crying why set Barabbas free the spotless lamb of heaven given there for me why climb that dreadful mountain? Why suffer agony? Why give his blood a fountain spilled and broken, flowing free? When he walked the road to Calvary, gave his life so willingly, 
broken there, the rose of Sharon died for me. It was for me, he cried, for me, he died, for me, he shed his blood upon a tree. It was for me. The King who came from heaven To the cry there is no room Now must lay his weary body In the cold and borrowed tomb But the grave it would not hold him his victory the risen Lord of glory is living now for me for me it was for me he cried for me he died for me he shed his blood upon a tree Let me get you to stand up for just a moment. You've been sitting, so stand up for just a moment. I don't want to destroy the mood, and uh, but I do want to give you a chance to just stretch a little bit, wake up a little bit. And you might have noticed the environment around you. So what I want you to do is this. I want you to turn around or turn to somebody beside you, shake hands. If it's somebody you don't know, say hi. My name is, and tell them your name. Or you might do this. You might say, is it just me or do you feel like you're in Hawaii this morning? <laughs> but just greet one another for just a moment. You may find your seat again. Good to have a number of guests with us this morning. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord together with us. If you have your Bible with you, uh, would you turn please to 2 Kings chapter 11. Second Kings chapter number 11. And then if you're also able to just kind of hold your place there, if you would go to uh, Psalm 127. So Psalm 127. Last week was Mother's Day, and we uh, chose to preach on the subject, God's ordained strength to still the enemy. 
And we talked about uh, Psalm 8, verse 2, where uh, the psalmist said, Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength to still the enemy and the avenger. And we were trying to honor the office of motherhood and, and uh, understand again how important it is, how fundamental it is. Well, that led me to this message this morning. I'm going to begin by reading Psalm 127, and then we'll go to 2 Kings 11. Psalm 127, verse 1 says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Would everybody in this room just acknowledge for a moment, whatever you want to do and do successfully and be and succeed, you need the Lord, the creator of the universe, the one who controls all things. It is vain for you, verse 2, to rise up early and sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Two words I want you to focus on for a moment, heritage and reward. The word heritage is often translated, as a matter of fact, probably over 90% of the time in the scripture. That Hebrew word is translated inheritance, an inheritance. We often look positively on an inheritance. And we want to invest it wisely and spend it wisely. We don't want to, to despise it or misuse it or abuse it. Children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Can I suggest to you that an inheritance and a reward, those two terms are meant to imply blessing, not burden. Blessing, not burden. Children are meant by God to be a blessing. They are his gift to you, not to be seen as a burden. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, the mighty man would use his bow and arrow to provide for his family, to reach out, to accomplish something in places where he could not be in presence. So to take, uh, to take something in the hunt, to provide for his family. Also, arrows were used for protection, provision and protection. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. And happy is the man, and if you'll allow me, I don't think I do violence to the text at all, happy is the man or woman that hath their quiver full of them. The quiver is the place uh, where the arrows rest where they are housed, uh, ready for service. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Did you notice the connection between the children being mighty arrows in the hand of a mighty man and speaking with the enemies in the gate? Can you connect that back to Psalm 8 and verse 2? Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Keep that in your mind, if you would, please. Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 11. Here's an, a very interesting story, and we're introduced to somebody who I would call a heroine, a female hero. Not much talked about or known in Scripture, but I hope you'll never forget her after this service. 2 Kings chapter 11. And when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead. Her son, by the way, was a king. And now he has been killed. And when she sees that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. In a word, she slew all of her grandchildren. Anyone who had a, a potential right to the throne that would threaten her desire to take the throne, she killed them. Tragic. Here's a mother 
That's what sin does. But, verse 2, Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons, which were slain. And they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. And he, that is Joash, the son of Ahaziah, was with her, that is Jehosheba, hid in the house of the Lord six years. And Athaliah did reign over the land. Let me just skip to the end here to verse 12. Because after six years, in the seventh year, the king Joash was given his rightful place as king. In verse 12 we read, And he brought forth the king's son, that's Joash, and put the crown upon him and gave him the testimony. And they made him king and anointed him and clapped their hands and said, God, save the king. At seven years of age, Joash becomes the king and he reigns for 40 years in, over Judah, over God's people. Last week I was ad- attempting with God's help to honor the value and importance of of motherhood, saying to you that motherhood is the crowning work of God's creation. His appointed means to defeat the enemy, his enemy, Satan, the deceiver. We noted that that truth illustrates the truth spoken years ago in a poem called The Hand That Rocks the Cradle Rules the World. So, Mom, I hope you haven't forgotten your tremendous position and privilege and place in God's plan. I remind you that we looked at Malachi 2.15, where the Bible says, or asks this question, God's asking His people this question, did not He, or excuse me, let me, let me start again, and did He not make one? It's referring to the relationship of the husband and wife. And God said the husband leaves his father and mother and cleaves unto his wife and they become one flesh. And God says, don't you remember that? Don't you realize that? Did he not make one? And then he asked the question, and wherefore one? In other words, why? That, and the answer, that he might seek a godly seed. The word seed means offspring, children. God made two to become one because he wanted a godly offspring. See, in the very beginning, God made the man and the woman, and the plan was that they would reproduce and that their children would grow up in the nurture and admonition and knowledge of God and become godly, and he would be magnified and glorified and honored. But from the days of the Garden of Eden until now, There has been a a vicious war waged by the enemy of God, that old serpent, Satan, the devil. In the very beginning, God said, I'm going to put enmity between thy seed, speaking to the serpent, and her seed, speaking about the woman. And that is a prophetic reference to the birth of Jesus Christ, ultimately, from the line that God has ordained, and that there would be war between men and women of faith and men and women of unbelief. There would be war between the offspring, those influenced by uh, Satan, and those who are obedient to God. By the way, can I just can I just make mention of something to you? And I'm not preaching doctrine here. So college students, take it easy on me, okay? In the beginning, God said, let us make man in our own image, us and our. We know from the Scripture's revelation that God is a trinity, three in one. One, yet three, in one. 
and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God said, let us make man in our own image. In the image of God created he them, male and female. So you have the two, and then said, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. So in a father and a mother and a child, you have a trinity. That's God's plan. That's a reflection of God. And there's fellowship and harmony and love within that trinity. And that's the way God ordained it to be. But the devil doesn't want that. He wants the throne that rightfully alone belongs to God. And so he's always attacking the home and always attacking and trying to change the way God set it up so that there's no godliness. Now, in case you wonder whether I'm off the rails here, go with me, if you want, to John chapter 8 and listen to the words of Jesus. He's speaking to Jewish people, the Hebrew people. And in verse 39 of John chapter 8, they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. And he was by way of the flesh. They're the seed of Abraham. Jesus saith unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Does anybody in this room know why he would say that? Because Abraham believed God. Abraham was a man of faith, and faith pleases God. And so he's saying, if you were a child of Abraham, you too would believe me, for I am God. And I've come in God's name, and I'm sharing with you God's message. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that had told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. They said to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus saith unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father, the devil. And the lusts, the desires of your father will ye do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. So Jesus is saying there are those who are the offspring of Satan. You are of your father, the devil, because you choose not to believe the truth, but instead of embrace the lie. So there is this distinction, and the battle rages, and the family is what is in the crosshairs of this battle between God and Satan. Because the family is God's ordained plan for this world. When I say crosshairs, do you know what I mean? Anybody here puzzled? Raise your hand and say, what do you mean crosshairs? I, it just dawned on me that crosshairs may not be familiar to everybody in this room because maybe you've never fired a weapon or, or a, a shot a gun. But crosshairs are typically uh, uh, hairs that are in the scope. And so when you're looking at the scope to try to see your target in the distance, you get them in the crosshairs. You want the, where those two hairs cross each other, right there, that's where you want to aim because that's where you're going to have success, right? So what's in the crosshairs? What is Satan after? He's after the family. He's after the destruction of the traditional family. And the attack is going on on every front and has been for a long time, but increasingly in the last hundred years or so. There is the promotion of a hedonistic material lifestyle that is attacking the home. There is the, permit, the, there is the front of a radical feminist ideology. There's abortion, sexual liberation, educational so-called reform, sexual orientation and gender identity, substance abuse, mindless entertainment. The world is all about social engineering, and they're trying through their social engineering to redefine the family as if they were the ones who created the family. But they weren't. What they don't know or understand, now I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, some do, 
But the majority of them don't know or understand that they're doing so because of the spirit of the one who is their father. The father of unbelief, the liar, Satan. And it's his war on the family and they're just his instruments or his tools having been deceived by him. So this morning, ladies and gentlemen of New Testament Baptist Church, I'm telling you, we are facing an incredible battle for the minds and souls of our children and for the minds and souls of the future of our nation. In our story in 2 Kings 11, we're introduced to two main characters, Athaliah and Jehoshaphat. You know how I, how I learned not to confuse them? Which is the evil one? Which is the good one? It's pretty easy. Athaliah. Liar sounds a lot like liar. And if you're from the South, that's exactly what it sounds like. You liar. <laughs> Athaliah. And Jehoshaphat. Jehovah. So the title of the message is, If Jehoshaphat doesn't get him, Athaliah will. Athaliah is out to destroy all the seed royal. But Jehoshaphat steps in, risks her life, and takes one of those children and hides him in the house of the Lord for six years. Can I say to you that if Jehovah doesn't get your children, the liar will. There's no middle ground. If Jehovah does not get your children, and by the way, the children of your neighbors and the children of our community and our city, if Jehovah doesn't get them, the liar will. Israel was a kingdom divided, a house divided. They had all been united under King Saul and under King David. And then when King Solomon uh, came to the, to the throne and then he died, the kingdom split. It was a family dispute and they split into two kingdoms. And the one, the northern kingdom it, called Israel and its capital is Samaria, pursued idolatry. They didn't necessarily intend to do that. They just decided because of the distance between them and Jerusalem, they would worship God in their own way. They would set up a different altar and they would worship there. They weren't abandoning the worship of God, but they were changing the worship of God. That's always the first step towards serious trouble. And before long, they're in idolatry. They're intermarrying with the heathen, idolatrous nations around them. And intermarriage with heathen people, if you have a godly seed and an ungodly seed, intermarrying, that's going to produce trouble. There needs to be harmony and agreement, and God warns us about that. Children, young people, you better listen carefully. The person that you feel God wants you to live the rest of your life with and to share your life with ought to be a, a dedicated, devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. Or you are buying into heartache and trouble and struggle that you cannot imagine. So this wicked queen, Athaliah, influenced her husband to kill all of his brothers. And after his death, her son, Ahaziah, became king. He died shortly after, and her lust for power so caused her to move to have all of her grandchildren killed because they were rivals to the throne she wanted. That's the story, but behind the story, the enemy of God is at work because God has promised a seed through which the world would find salvation. And if you trace the promise of the seed of the woman through the scripture, it comes down to the house of David, the tribe of Judah, the house of Jesse, and the house of David. And this young man, Joash, is the last remaining heir, the last possible descendant to mount the throne. If he is slain, then God's promise cannot be fulfilled as it was given in scripture. Are you listening? This is the heir to the throne. And the devil knows that, and he hates God, and he hates God's plan, and he's seeking to destroy it and defeat it. 
It should be no surprise to anyone in this room that children are the easiest prey for the devil or for the enemy. I'm saying to you this morning, if godly parents don't train their own children, if the church does not actively rise up and reach out to children, we can know this for sure. The world and Satan, the God of this world, will capture them and will destroy them. He's a liar from the beginning and a murderer from the beginning. Mom and dad, do you understand how important children are? Do you understand what is at stake? We talked about this for a few minutes last week. What's our world going to be like if the children of the world grow up and take positions of leadership in homes and in businesses and in churches and in government and in schools and they know not God? They are idolaters and materialistic. You want to know what it's going to be like? It's happening around you right now. That's what's wrong with our leadership. They were abandoned and they grew up without the knowledge of God and without the careful attention of mom and dad and God's people. Today's children are tomorrow's leaders. And the first leadership that takes place in any society is within the home. So who's going to lead the home? It's your son that's going to lead the home tomorrow. It's your daughter that's going to be the wife who gives birth to the children who will rule and reign tomorrow. And the devil is working overtime to corrupt and blind the hearts and minds of our children. His goal? To immobilize them, to paralyze them as far as any potential for glorifying God is concerned. He first of all seeks to kill them through abortion, which is murder, by the way. If he cannot kill them through abortion, he then emotionally devastates and destabilizes them through the dividing and the tearing apart of their family, their parents. And then he would pervert them through peer pressure and conformity to the world. Joash is the hope in this record of two worlds. He's the hope of time, the world of time in which he lived, because this is the royal seed, the rightful heir to the throne of David that will bring God's blessing upon the people. So he's the hope of the world, and Jehoshaphat knows that. But he's not just the hope of time, he's the hope of the world we call eternity. Because eternity will only be possible for men through the seed of, uh, called Jesus Christ that will come through the line of Joash. And so in saving Joash, not only is the hope of, the, of time being answered, but the hope of eternity is being answered. And I'm hoping that you will see that your children are the hope of two worlds. They're the hope of the world in which we live right now, time. And they're the hope of the world in which we're going to live in eternity. They're crucial to both. So in Psalm 127, we read that herit the children are a heritage, a reward uh, from God. They're a blessing, not a burden. Uh, you and I have been given them as a gift to steward for God. And my friend, you're not just responsible for their physical welfare, but their spiritual welfare as well. Proverbs 22, 6, do you know it? King Solomon, the wise man, said, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go. What are you training your children to become? What do you say to your children you should or you should not? 
Because every time you say you should, or you guide them, or you give them permission, or you allow them, you are training them in the way that they should go. They're trusting you that you're showing them the way they should go. And I promise you, if you're not telling them the right way to go, they will go the wrong way. And when they are old, they will not depart from it, except by a miracle of the amazing grace and mercy of Almighty God. But it won't be without heartache and tears and sorrow. Would you be honest with me this morning? Think about everything you have your children involved in. Go ahead, just think about it for a minute. What classes do you have them enrolled in? What entertainment do you have them attending? What sports do you have them involved with? What crowd attends those things? What's the goal of those things? What's the dress of those events? What's the language of those events? What, what is the greatest influence in your children's life? Is it directing them to love God, to serve God, to love man, to be pure, to be moral, to be honest, to be truthful, to be right, to be fair, to be honest? Or are you allowing them to do things because you feel you're missing out or they'll be missing out or the world will laugh at you or scorn you or mock you because you don't allow them to participate in those things? I'm not the Holy Spirit, but I prayed this morning the Holy Spirit would deeply convict some hearts in this room. The activities your kids are involved in, you stop and think about it. next time you're sitting there watching them do it. Say, what am I teaching them here? Are they learning morality or immorality? Are they learning decency or indecency? Are they learning godliness or ungodliness? Are they learning character or the fulfilling of their lusts, pleasures? And how much time? So here's Joash, six years, and I love that. Six years, as an infant, to the, till the time he's about seven, he's hid where? In the house of God. Oh, by the way, do you know why they hid him in the house of God? Because Athaliah is not about to go to the house of God. The wicked people who want to destroy the royal seed don't go to the house of God. So you know where you ought to have your kids every single time the doors are open? Every time you can, you ought to have them in the house of God. Because the wicked don't want to come here. And they'll leave them alone. But what we do so often is we take them out of the house of God... And absent them from the house of God and take them to the place where the world, unbeknownst to them, they're just deceived by Satan, but the world will entice them and draw them away. We don't want the world to come in here, but we'll let, take our kids out and deliver them to the world. Say, so here they are, teach them. Here they are, influence them. Here they are, show them how to live. Here they are. Now, now <laughs> I don't want you to get upset with me. Your home, if in your home, and that's where it begins, you honor God, you honor Christ, you honor the Scripture, you pray together, you teach your children right from wrong, then when they're out in the world, you can't escape it. We're in the world. You can still participate, but you need to watch where they are. But if you are not doing that at home, if you are not preparing them and teaching them, keeping them in the house of God and at home doing your responsibility, and you're letting them go out in the world, I'm telling you, you are on your way to great sorrow and heartache. Do you understand and appreciate the power of your influence this morning? Somebody said one time, no greater blessing for a child in this world than to have godly parents. No greater blessing. Not to have money, not to have lands, not to have cars and toys and all those things, but not the greatest blessing is to have godly parents. And they said, secondly, the greatest blessing for a parent is to have godly children. Godly children, are you willing to risk anything for your kids? Jehoshaphat is going to risk her life to intervene, to save the heir to the throne. Your kids are heirs to the throne. Your kids are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. If they're saved, that's what they're intended to be. They're intended to be like Him and to rule and reign with Him. Are you seeing them that way? Are you willing to risk 
the scorn of this world, the hatred of this world. Do you know what, uh, Je- Je- uh, what Athaliah said when she saw that the king was, that, that this young man, jo- Joash, had survived and was now being made king? Look at verse number 14. And when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar as the manor was, and the princes and trumpeters by the king, and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew with trumpets. When the righteous reign, the people rejoice. But notice Athaliah's response. She rent her clothes and cried, treason, treason. She's the one committing treason against the throne. And today, when people send their children to a Christian school or homeschool them, they're called, it's treason against the country. We're destroying our country's future. We are are destroying the unity and the future of our country. Treason, treason, and we're the bad guys. But it's no more true now than it was then. This was treason to kill and to murder and to try to destroy children, the seed of God, that which God has ordained to steal the enemy and the avenger. So first of all, I'm challenging mom and dad. It begins with you. It's your responsibility. I'm pleading and begging and praying that you will see it and will renew and rededicate yourself. You will reevaluate everything your kids are doing and say, where is this going to lead them? If they continue and they succeed in this, where, who are they going to be hanging out with? What are they going to be exposed to? Uh, what are they going to be wearing? What, how are they going to be living? What's going to be the future? Stop and think about it. They may not like you now, but they'll like you later. My mom and dad were tough on me, but I love them with all my heart, and I'm so glad they were. And then I'm challenging the church. She hid them in the house of God. Are we willing as a church to take the risk to get involved with children? Are we willing to go out and find them and bring them in? Are we willing to welcome them and accept them and teach them and let them see and experience the worship of the living God? Are we willing to to bring them here where they can experience that God is real out there? They're going to see a God that's not real, who has no eyes, has eyes, but he can't see, ears, but he can't hear, mouth, but he can't speak, hands, but he can't act. But bring them here so they can see the living God. Imagine what it was like watching the sacrifices and hearing the scripture read and watching the cleansing and having all of that explained to you and taught to you. Those are the formative years of life. And he was being prepared so that even at a young age, he could take a position of leadership and responsibility. Church, we quit. We quit the bus ministry. We quit kids kids clubs. You know why? Because number one, we don't understand the war. And number two, we're too busy pursuing material gain and material pleasures and material things. And we're not willing to sacrifice the time. Kids can be messy and time-consuming, but they're the most important thing God has ever put in our path and in our trust. I wonder if God would wake somebody up in this room to say, by the grace of God, I'm going to be a Sunday school teacher. I'm going to go out and find some kids and I'm going to start a class. Or I'm going to come up to Mrs. McLean or Mrs. Hurd or one of these that are up in their late 60s and 70s and been teaching for years and say, I want to learn from you because I want to be ready to take over for you. I wonder who would be willing to say, I'll give a Tuesday night if, Pastor, if you'll let me and start a kids club and we'll go out and find one or two kids and then we'll build it from there. But let's bring some kids in. Let's offer them some opportunity to hear about God, to know God, to hear the true and living God. Who is going to help them if the church does not? What voice of truth are they going to ever have a chance of hearing if it's not the voice of truth that comes from the people of God? They're just being raised by people who are blinded and deceived by the liar who's out to destroy them. And the destruction is is inevitable and it is inescapable. It's awful. Can we see this morning what's happening around us? What are we doing about it? What are we willing to do? What are we willing to risk? What are we willing to sacrifice? Satan throughout the ages, and I don't have time to preach it, but I could go through this book and show you how Satan was behind mass murderers of children. He always desires and accepts child sacrifice. But Almighty God 
finds a pleasing sacrifice when you selflessly submit and surrender your time and energy and attention to children. Jesus saw them trying to keep the children from him, and he stopped them and said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. Are we welcoming them? Do we want them? Do we love them? Do we understand? Jonathan Edwards, a preacher of yesteryear, said this, I challenge you, go fill a bushel full of wheat. And when you've got it chock full of wheat, go give it to the devil and say, I challenge you to sow some tares. He said, and after you've done that, why don't you go get a bucket or a bushel basket and fill it full of tares. That's fake. That's not real wheat, right? Fill it full of tares, chock full, and then give it to the parent and say, I challenge you to sow some wheat. That's what we're doing. We're letting our kids' lives be full of tares and then trying to plant a little wheat here and there rather than filling them with wheat so that when the world tries to plant tares, there's no room for it. It's rejected. Jehoshaphat acted in faith, and she acted on behalf of a future generation by preserving the rightful heir to the throne. Will you and I stop living selfishly and start living sacrificially and start living in obedience to God? And would we look to the future and realize that the future of our homes, our families, our businesses, our, our sports world, our entertainment, our community, our base, the future depends upon the children who take over the reins of that future. Would you this morning begin to see children as God's gift to you? Would you dedicate them to God and dedicate yourself to them for God? Would you give them a place of refuge in the house of God? Would you take them there? Would you delight them? Would you help them to love the house of God? Would you lead the way? And will you believe with all of your heart that God gave them a life because he has a royal destiny for them? He has a royal plan and purpose for them. Parents, mom, dad. And if you're not a parent, single ladies, single men, seniors, why can't we work with kids? Why can't we come alongside the parents and encourage them? Every one of you ought to ask the secretary for a church directory. And in the church directory, you have the name of every child that's a member of our church. You could pray for them every day. You could call them up and say, I'm so glad you go to our church. You know how much Jesus loves you and died for you? If I can ever be a blessing to you, I want to be a blessing for you. I'm so glad. I hope you love your mom and dad. Your mom and dad are special. Could you do that? Could you write them a note? Could you invite them over and do something godly? Not park them in front of a, 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 front of a computer game or, or a television or a movie? Do something fruitful and productive with them? I'm telling you this, the bottom line, it's very simple and illustrated amply for us in this text. If Jehoshaphat doesn't get Joash, Athaliah will. And it's all over. Don't leave this room. Just, well, that was something and go out and forget it. Oh, I hope you'll never forget it. There's nothing more important in this world to anyone in this room than raising a godly heritage for God, raising a godly seed. Would you give yourself a fresh and new to it this morning? Let's stand together. Please, heads bowed and eyes closed. It might be that you've joined us this morning here at the church and you do not have a personal living relationship with the living God through faith in Jesus Christ. You're not, as the scripture says, and as we sang at the beginning of the service, you must be born again. You're not born again. You don't understand that. You're just born the first time. You've never been born a second time by faith in Jesus Christ. You've never had God's gift of life imparted to you. I beg you. I plead with you. It all begins there. Please don't go to hell. Don't miss eternity with God in heaven. The soul that sinneth it shall die and sin being separation from God. But God is willing to to Forgive your sin and to justify you, as we heard sung this morning. I beg you, when the invitation begins here in a moment, just come and stand at the front. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, a member of this church, and you know how to talk to somebody about Christ, you ought to be watching and observing. If somebody comes and stands here at the front, then you come and join them and say, can I help you? Can I share with you? We want more than anything in the world for you to come to faith in Jesus Christ. 
mom and dad, kids. The message is for you too. Love and honor your mom and dad. Realize how important your life is. Don't throw it away. Don't, don't go the wrong direction. Don't love the wrong things. The altar's open. You can come and kneel here. You can stand. You can pray. You can sit down where you are, whatever. But would you spend the next few minutes talking to God? And if you need help and counsel and prayer, we'll be glad to help you. I'm going to go. I'm going to leave the service in, in the charge of Pastor Tricky as I'm getting ready for baptism. But the, the pianist is going to begin to play. You just obey the voice of God. If it's uncomfortable you to stand and you need to be seated, go ahead and be seated. It's okay. We understand that. And maybe you want to be seated and pray, or maybe you want to come up here at the altar and pray. Oh, I beg you. There's nothing more important going on in the world today than loving kids, leading kids, showing them the way, devoting ourselves to their godly growth and development. May the Lord lead you, and may He find us obedient. I don't know how you're a parent this morning and not in your heart at the very least begging God for help. If you think about it, <clears throat> every aspect of the world seems to be geared against us raising our kids for the glory of God. We need his help. a parent in here this morning but you have a relationship with the Lord I, I hope that you will look around and see the kids in your life and pray for them look for ways to participate actively in their spiritual well-being maybe you're not physically able to do much but you can pray to God and you can ask God to give the parents wisdom to give the church wisdom the leadership what can we do I feel it's important just to continue with the invitation for a few minutes, but you're welcome to be seated if everyone would please be seated and just pray where you're at. Some are still at the altar. Let's just keep our minds and hearts in prayer for a few minutes before we can end the service. And in the, here this morning, a teenager or close to it, you know, you have a part in this as well. The Bible tells us, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Are you obeying your parents? Are you giving them a hard time? Are you rebelling? Ask the Lord to give you help, to give you strength. It may be you need to go to your parents, ask their forgiveness. Say, help me to do right. Help me to do better. Give me some scripture to memorize. Pray with me. It's important, kids. Amen. Thank you so much for your kind attention this morning. What a wonderful truth from scripture. Heart-wrenching at the same time, but uh, what we need to hear, amen? And I'm thankful uh, for the Lord speaking to my heart this morning. Well, just a, a few announcements, and uh, then we're going to have a uh, baptismal service. And before I forget, so let me just invite you to please stay around for lunch today. 
And there's extra food because we have guests, and some of you brought more than just the typical finger foods that we normally have, but everyone's welcome to stay uh, downstairs and enjoy a time of food and fellowship. We'll meet back in here uh, between 12.15 and 12.30 to start the afternoon service, and some of the Faithway uh, students will be participating in that as well as the teen class this afternoon, so uh, looking forward to having them stay around. Uh, yesterday was a great success, and I just want to say on behalf of uh, Mrs. McLean and the ladies and Pastor uh, thank you for all your help. And I, we, we kind of teased about it yesterday uh, when we saw all this. We decided to leave all the decoration up. If we had visitors pop in, we thought they may think we were a strange church. <laughs> Look at all the uh, odd decoration. But uh, the theme, of course, uh, was refresh, relax, renew. It's kind of here. And it was a beach type theme. And it was a wonderful uh, event. And thank you so much for everyone who was able to participate. In light of kids and raising kids, you may have noticed the banner in the back uh, in the lobby for the Atwell Center. The Atwell Center, or it's also called Formula for Hope, uh, it's been known uh, to what they do, their purpose is to raise money and to aid from a Christian perspective and worldview uh, those who find themselves in an unplanned parent, uh, pregnancy. Uh, whether it's a, a lady who just finds herself pregnant or a couple and they don't know what they do, um, they're obviously the goal is to prevent them from an abortion and to try and help them and guide them uh, in raising that child and giving them the resources they need. So we support this uh, every, every year. And uh, in the back on the table, there's a little baby bottle. And you're welcome to take one of those. If you like to see and, and plan the money, maybe you want to have your kids involved, you can save some loonies, toonies, put it in there. And then on Father's Day, that's when they accept that offering. So it started Mother's Day. And then on Father's Day, uh, we'll, we'll take those bottles and we'll see that they get to the Atwell Center. On the back of that display, there's also a QR code you can scan. It brings you right up to a Donate Now button so you can give that way. Uh, but it's, it's definitely worth considering. You know, we, we want to stand up for what's right. We uh, want to do what we can to help in those areas, and that's one center. Uh, by the way, they also accept volunteers. So if that's something you want to get involved with, uh, what a wonderful way to do that, to work towards uh, of preserving life and uh, honoring the Lord. So that's going on from last Sunday until Father's Day. So uh, work towards that. There's some things in the bulletin just to be uh, mindful of. There's a men's prayer breakfast on June the 10th, and we tell you that now, so men, you can mark your calendar. And uh, so something doesn't pop up. When God's people are together to pray, powerful things can happen. And uh, please plan on being there June the 10th for the men's prayer breakfast. Uh, the Lord's Supper will be observed the next day on Sunday the 11th. There's a joy luncheon on June the 24th. And our seniors, if you can let Howard and Wendy know as soon as possible, I know it's a blessing uh, for them to do that. So mark that on your calendar and commit uh, to that as well. Next Sunday, we'll be taking a special offering. And uh, that offering will go towards the ministry of Faithway Bible College, Faithway Baptist Bible College. And uh, we decided to do that next Sunday. We have them here today. And uh, you can familiarize yourself with some of the students during the lunchtime and get to see how God works there and what God is doing. And next Sunday, we'll, ma we'll make a point to take up a special offering uh, for Faithway. So that will be uh, next Sunday. I wonder, before they come up for baptism, if there's anybody that wants to share a quick word of testimony or a prayer request, a praise. It can be one word, something you're thankful for. It can be one sentence or two until I cut you off. Anybody? <laughs> yes, Benjamin. He's thankful for the church. <laughs> Amen. Yes, Mrs. McLean. I just want to thank all the ladies who came out yesterday for the ladies' meeting. Mm. Amen. Praise the Lord. Someone else. Emilio. For what? A father? Amen. Thankful for father. Amen. One more. Anybody else? Natasha. Thankful for grandchildren who turned one year old. Natasha is a one grandchild. Can't believe it already. Flo's great grandson. All right, well, let's, let's just praise the Lord uh, in a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll have our baptismal service. <clears throat> Father, we're so grateful for the blessing of our services today. Lord, thank you for speaking to our hearts, and Lord, we are so often in need of this type of preaching, and your word has just the ability to pierce our hearts and, Lord, get to the nitty-gritty of what we need to deal with. And, Lord, my prayer is that all of us will be willing to do that. 
Lord, that we'll accept that conviction with the right spirit and, Lord, want to do better and want to commit ourselves to raising our children or whatever it is, however you deal with us, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless this, these who are going to be baptized today. Oh, Lord, thank you for their willingness to follow you in obedience. And, Lord, we pray uh, that your hedge of protection would be about them, Lord, and that they would begin this journey of publicly living their Christian life in a way that will bring you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, it's our privilege and joy today to baptize three. I just want to make uh, preface remarks with reminding you that the, um, what you're about to witness is not somebody being saved. These are, these are young people who have understood the gospel. They knew that they were sinners. They needed a savior or they'd be separated from God for eternity. And they knew that God so loved them, he gave his only begotten son. He came and died in their place, paid their sin debt on Calvary. They opened their heart in faith and received Christ as Savior. At that moment, they were born again. They became a part of God's family. But in terms of our profession before men, uh, the Lord Jesus has taught us to uh, publicly profess our faith in him, and we do it through the believer's baptism. So today when they come, they're not washing away their sin. They are testifying to you that they love the Lord Jesus and they want to be a follower and disciple of the Lord Jesus. And uh, they will automatically be accepted in the membership of New Testament Baptist Church because of their profession of uh, faith in Jesus Christ and their baptism. And we have the responsibility then to join with them and receive them and to disciple them and to help them grow and uh, work together. So I'm delighted to introduce to you three. I'm gonna start with the youngest. So this is uh, uh, Wyatt, oops, yeah. They were anticipating something else. Let Y come out first. There you go. Wow. That's quite a t shirt. Mm. Trying to scare me? Wyatt is eight years old, right? Um, Wyatt Roswell. And Wyatt, uh, you talked to me in my office and told me that you have been saved. Is that correct? Yes. You're trusting in Jesus Christ for your salvation. And you love the Lord Jesus. And you want to follow him in believer's baptism? Yes. Amen. Wonderful. All right. Brother Wyatt, upon your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go ahead and come, Alexa. So this is Alexa Peace. Alexa is 15 years of age. Had the privilege of watching Alexa uh, grow up. Uh, just lives around the block from the church here. And has been a part of New Testament Baptist Academy through the years. And uh, Alexa came and requested to be baptized. So Alexa, is it your public testimony to all of those assembled here today that your faith and trust for eternal salvation is in Jesus Christ and him alone? Yes. Amen. And uh, it's your desire to be known publicly as his disciple and to follow him in obedience? Yes. All right. Amen. Sister Alexa, upon your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus and obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, bearing the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. This is Alexa's older sister. This is Mackenzie Peace. Mackenzie is 18. I'm taller than you. Yes, you are. <laughs> you didn't have to point that out. <laughs> no, I don't feel bad. <laughs> it's been a joy to watch Mackenzie grow as well and uh, see her. Uh, struggle through and uh, she's getting ready to graduate just just in a month or so uh, from school go on with her future and uh, I know Mackenzie has trusted Christ her Savior she's done that quite some time ago but had never felt ready to follow the Lord in believers baptism but it's your desire now to make this public your profession of faith and yes. honor the Lord Jesus and to be known as his disciple and to follow him with all your heart yes. 
Don't drop me. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> Mackenzie, upon your public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus and obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, bearing the likeness of his death. <laughs> Raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> well, thank you for staying to witness that, and I trust that you will be committed to pray for these young people as they follow the Lord. They face a world that's very hostile to faith, and uh, pray much for them, and be a support and encouragement to them wherever you can. So the Faithway.